talk here at the Martin E. Siegel the Theater Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY in Manhattan, the city of New York, which is being hit so, so hard um, uh, by this virus. And uh, we live uh, in a time, as someone said, it's Artodian time, and we all have to stay on the right side of madness. Um, as, as Richard Schechner said, it's a Fukushima type of uh, explosion we live mm -hmm. in but the reactor's roof is open. We look inside, we see everything. We see the structures, the forms that don't work. It's all naked and it's, it's existential. Everybody in this theater business is still out of work uh, for months and months and months ahead. Nobody knows what's going on, what will happen, when they will reopen. And um, we are speaking since 12 weeks now to artists uh, around the world from Egypt and Taiwan and China and, uh, and uh, Belgium, Germany, Italy, and uh, South Africa, Burkina Faso, everywhere to, um, to hear from artists, what shall we be doing? What shall we be thinking about? What do we have to do? What is of importance at the moment? Mm -hmm. And uh, the situation here is disastrous in America. It's shocking. Like yesterday we had a call from Malaysia. They said our government was magnificent. Everything is working well. and. Uh, and uh, here it is, and there are reasons and for it, and there are forms that work, as Joseph Boy said, form, forms that don't, and that's why art is important because it questions forms and it shows new forms. With us today, we have an artist uh, who I think is uh, 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 really um, an innovator, um, a creative force, and someone we should all listen to. Her engagement in art and life with her work, her body, and her own work is, uh, is uh, uh, truly exceptional. And she is close to our field, the field of performance and theater. Even so, of mm -hmm. course, it is far away from the well-made British play um, that we see so often of Broadway's when white families sit around tables and discuss their problems. It's completely mm -hmm. different. And it's Tanya Bruguera. Mm -hmm. And of those of us in the audience who know who she is, know who she is, but she's a Cuban uh, uh, artist who early on um, had a, a radical, I think, political, social agenda in her art, but it also art, it has a great aesthetic, and she has been in trouble um, for, uh, for what she did. It's about power and control her work, and she's been arrested, mm -hmm. jailed for her work, um, but she has created amazing things, and also in New York, actually, in, uh, I think, in Corona, in Queens, where she lived with a family with five kids, and there also she created um, her school, the Catreda Arte de Conducta, the Behavior Art School, which she also did um, in Havana. And um, I think you all should look her up, but she is well known. She doesn't really need us. Um, what we need is to hear from Tanya. Also, how is she going through this time? How is she experiencing it? And um, what is of importance for all of us to think about, and we have to uh, think in, in new ways. Tanya, thank you, thank you, thank you for uh, for joining us. Where are you, and what time is it? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this amazing series of conversations. Um, well, I'm right now in Havana. Uh, it's super hot, and not only in temperature, but also in activism. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, today, uh, we are one of the reasons I, you know, uh, you know, I was uh, kind of uh, very close to the moment of the starting is because we had three, uh, four um, friends, uh, activists who have been detained right now. Right so, now. Right now. The... So I was talking to the people in the campaign to see what we do because what they have done, basically, they were uh, sitting in the park with their, I don't know how you say in English, mask. the mask. The mask. Um, and the police came because he was going to smoke and then they came and took them to prison. But of course we know it's because their activism. And today they were going to go to uh, legally, that's our right, that if something is wrong, you go to the, uh, to the legal branch and you bring a letter signed that you don't agree with what happened. So they didn't let them arrive, they were detained. So they are, have no rights to even go to the legal channels to, to protest. We cannot go out here. We have a little activist envy <laughs> of what is happening in the US right now with everybody is in the streets and is being very open about what happened because here there is no way you can go outside to 
to protest. Um, but well, other than that, things are quite okay and during this time. And I just want, before we start to, to say um, how sorry I am for all the people who, who have lost a loved one in this, and for the people who, who are going through this uh, very difficult uh, uh, illness, no? Um, I personally have uh, some friends from Corona uh, who, who had gone through this because one of them was working at the supermarket and they didn't give him any of the protection. So he actually had the virus. And of course, all the family was contaminated. Thank God they are all okay at the moment. But I have many friends who, who them or their partners have been... Um, Infected. I, I am a very um, amazed how quickly authoritarianism has seen a little space to, to conquer the world during this time and how they have confused um, a moment where everybody should be thinking and protecting themselves with um, the, let's say, desire of governments to protect themselves instead of protect the people. And uh, by that, I mean how, even in the United States, you see, the, I follow the news has been amazing, but also in Europe and of course here in Cuba as well, um, how this has been a moment in which power has taken advantage to try to control people even more. I don't know how it's happening for you there, but here at least is amazing uh, how quote unquote well is going. But the reason it's going well is because they know the name of everybody who lives in every place. They know exactly everything about everybody. So that's kind of a scary how they are justifying um, eliminating rights uh, in exchange for health. No. Um, so yeah, and um, I don't know, I mean, I want to hear also your questions, but I think at least for me, this coincide with a decision I had made to stop. <laughs> I have made a decision that after July, I was going to stop because I was in this kind of machine, uh, production machine where I was traveling a lot. I was doing a lot of little things. And sometimes I feel that um, as artists, artists, of course, who have no safeguard, no, do you don't have a job or you, you have to go from gig to gig, no? It's a little bit um, harsh for the work itself because you are trying to survive in, instead of saying, okay, now I'm going to sit down and think one big. So I had decided, I, to say, okay, after July, I'm going to stop. So this came a little earlier, but uh, in a way, in my personal case, it has been very good because I stopped. I stopped and I had for the last two months read, think, and, and decide to stop. You know, we don't need to overproduce. We don't need to talk all the time. I was telling a friend the other day that he was very uh, nervous because he was, working more now than ever and and also being paid less than ever you know mm -hmm. because there is interesting with this kind of social a kind of shift uh, happen uh we need to make sure that we protect our rights not only the most um you know evident one like the free speech etc but also that we protect the right to live of our work, and also the right to do art that is meaningful. Because another thing that I have been seeing is an amazing thing for art where it is more popular than ever, because of course people need entertainment, people need something that makes them go to another place in, the, in their mind, etc. But are we, but I see at the same time people showing art that is, um, it's going to sound harsh, but that is not done with the depth 
of art. I don't know how to say. It. I understand immediacy, and sometimes you can do a, a, an immediate reaction that is amazing and super complex. But I always defend in these times of Trump, of oversimplification of uh, feelings, oversimplification of, of subjects, the, the right for art to be done with as much layers of analysis and complexity as possible. You know, like it's not only, how can I say, is how can we keep art that is done differently in this time because definitely this is going to change and shift the form in which we communicate our feelings, our, our doubts, you know, our conclusions, whatever. But how can we do art that is immediate, is popular? Because now we have, at least in my lifetime, is the first time that I see the possibility for art to go mainstream for real. You know, because everybody wants to hear an opera, everybody is happy to hear somebody, you know, Yo-Yo Ma, you know, on his website. Everybody wants to hear things that normally are prohibited to them, right? Because money or because it's high culture and they think they don't belong. But now this has been uh, more accessible. But at the same time, I wonder how can we create art that is talking to everybody but it still has this kind of humanistic condition that can survive the moment. No, this is something I'm, I'm thinking a lot right now because definitely it almost feels that there is an opportunity to change the form of art. I'm not saying that it's going to happen because unfortunately, I think this is a good opportunity to, to change many things you know, to change many things in the arts and in society. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, it seems that people forget what is painful very quickly, right? And all the lessons that you learn during that painful process are quickly substituted for something easier or something more satisfying, etc. cetera, no? So I'm not having a lot of hope, but I think it's a very good moment and I'm thinking a lot about that. What form can art have? today you know what how can we do art really uh that goes that talks to more people than than ever because even theater i mean of course you have uh, street theater you have other things but theater you go there because you already want that mostly right if it's conventional theater you go to the cinema you go to the theater or even to a you know, a cultural center, because you want that. You already are seeking an experience of growth, of questioning, of, of learning. But does people have time for that? Do people want that? Learning and growing is painful, you know? It's easier to just consume. So how can we create desire for the pain of learning? You know, how can we do an art that is seductive enough that people understand that growing is a beautiful process they can experience, you know? So I think this is for this is a thing I've been thinking a lot. And the other thing is something I already um, sketch, uh, let's say, in the piece I did for the Tate uh, Turbine, where I was trying to talk about what are the values by which our institutions are behaving, you know? What are the values we use in society uh, today to, to decide that somebody is more important than other, that someone needs more attention than other, deserves more attention than other, or what somebody is saying is more uh, transcendental than another, no? And how we have substituted in a way all the, and I did it, let me say, because I'm sure people don't know this, but the piece I did was basically working with the neighborhood uh, neighbors of Tate Modern and have in London, yeah. In London, yes, yeah, sorry. I, I have the question how, what should the museum do for you to feel it belongs to you? How can you have something to say in an institution that is in your neighborhood but operates internationally and it has a huge impact internationally? So after many, many discussion and conversation with the neighbors, which by the way, is an organization that still is running after the project finished, 
uh, and now they are independent from me. And I mean, I'm still in the shops and everything, but I don't want to, I want them to do, to, to have the freedom of grow their own way. And we decided after many discussions that one of the things that is more, um, let's say, um, uh, scary in a way in our institution is how money is substituting substitutes value and work to be done for the community. And in that sense, for example, buildings in the past were named after very important people, people who did something quite important for the society. Now, if you have a lot of money, you can buy it. That doesn't mean that you have done anything uh, good for the community, just you can have a shortcut. So we decided to change the name of one of the two buildings of the Tate Modern for um, the name of one of the community organizers of the neighborhood who have worked for more than 25 years with youth at risk and recently with elders in the community. And she had literally saved hundreds of kids from the street and you know put them back in a job or, or school. And we thought this is a person who deserves to have a name, you know, uh, a building name after her. And by the way, it's not going to be in the news. She's not going to be in the news for the job she does. So, so it's interesting, no? What are we promoting today, no? The Kardashians, but then we don't have anybody know what she does or supporting what they do, no? So I think that, that was the, a little sketch of bringing back the discussion of what are the values of our institutions, how we also have been substituting ethics for, um, for let's say, the vendas we say in Espanol, for, um, for things that are um, uh, useful for you, you know, um, and how all the values are very, the ethical value is almost seen as a ridiculous, ridiculousness, you know, in institutions, you know, you, I say institution, but as an example of society in general, you know? mm -hmm. So I think this is what I'm thinking these days, and this is what I think is important. You know, I, I don't have hope, but, but I wish that all this time brings at least some sort of new reorganization of society and of what are we, how are we operating, you know? And in the arts of the form, I definitely, we need to start, uh, yeah, being more, uh, less elitist, I think. I don't know, this is what I've been thinking so far. Um, yeah. yeah, that's, uh, yeah. that is significant yeah. and. Um, yeah, but I don't have any hope, you know? <laughs> as you soon don't? As everything, no, because I, as soon as everything opens, people are going to go to the comfort zone again. It's quite hard to be in, an uncomf in your uncomfortable zone, you know? And we are not educated for that. Our schools don't educate us to be, um, you know, in searching, <laughs> you know, they educate us to to achieve, not to search, you know. So I think this is uh, some of the things that I, uh, and I've been looking a lot. And for example, another things that I was thinking is how, for example, the arts, um, the, yesterday there was a friend who put, sent me a photo of, um, of, you know, one of these things that goes in the newspaper, we say, what are the most, the, the 10 most important jobs and what are the 10 less important jobs that we can get rid of? Number one of get rid of is artists. Hmm. That was number one. So people think art is, you know. So, and at the same time, I feel that institutions have to start having a different commitment with artists and with the staff. I've seen a lot of, um, of articles about big museums that have laid off um, their, most of their staff, especially the people who are more vulnerable, like people who work in education and you know, security, et cetera. And I think this is, this is highly problematic. I understand it's easy if you don't run an institution to say that, but at the same time, when you think how much money they pay for the insurance of one painting. That could be the salary of all their staff for a year. 
So I think I'm not saying don't have the insurance. I'm saying you need to educate your donors. You need to educate the people or the you know the funding uh, the people who fund your museum that they have to understand that the people who work there are the institution. The institution is not a building. It's not you know a room with stuff in it. Institution is the people who work in it. And, and I feel this is also very problematic also because some of my friends have called and say that, as I said before, they're working more than ever and pay less than ever. And, um, and, and I wonder what is going to happen with the artists who have no jobs, like no teaching jobs or no, what is going to happen? A lot of the events have been postponed for next year. Um, I know that there have been some initiative to support artists, like some foundations and some people. But is it now maybe the moment to think how we can structurally change the way artists are supported? How we can structurally change the way in which we think of, you know, uh, not only money, but other supports like insurance or, you know, or other ways of support or housing, you know? Um, because a lot of artists are living in a very day-to-day -day situation. Yeah, you go to a residency for six months and it's finished, where do you go? So can we start thinking, I'm, this is a, a call to the institutions, no? Can we start thinking, I'm sure they are doing this, but about how can we create longer term um, support for people, you know? Um, and not in a competitive way, because always a solution is a, um, a grant or a prize. No, there should be other structures, no? Because there are only so many art schools that people can teach or so many, you know, art centers. So I don't know. I mean, these are the things I've been thinking. Um, I've been also working in uh, two new pieces, <laughs> theater plays. Um, and one is for next year, the festival in uh, Vienna. It was going to be now, but it was postponed. And it is um, uh, based on Galileo, Brecht, mm -hmm. Life of Galileo. And it's very interesting because many things that we were thinking felt almost like aesthetic exercise, no? Mm -hmm. Like a, and now they have more relevance because things are happening and we are seeing how we need to take, for example, in the case of Galileo, uh, what decision are you going to make? You know, are you going to betray your, your belief for survival or are you going to carry on? No. And the other piece is one I'm doing uh, for Lola Arias. It's going to be on Friday, this Friday. She has this project, My Documents, mm -hmm. and is uh, uh, based on the Madre Coraje, Mother Courage. Mother Courage. Also. Mm -hmm. I think I'm in my break moment. And um, yeah, but it's uh, related to a personal experience I had here, so. The first so, yeah, experience? Huh? Say, say again, it's related to the first experience? No, it's related to one experience I had recently with uh, my mom passing. Tell, tell us and, about uh, it. Wow, but you have to see it on Friday. They're going to kill yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, oh, no, 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 just a little bit, yeah. Yeah, Lola yeah, Arias. Yeah, so it's mm -hmm. kind of making a relationship because the idea of desire and desireless and how maybe a way, I mean, it's a very, very free reading of it, uh, but it's related to um, how not to desire, you know, how to be in a state of desirelessness, you know, how to exercise not wanting stuff, you know. And also this relationship also related to Cuba because in Cuba uh, it's very interesting that people who actually fight for the rights and are activists, they are many times accused by the government of doing this because they want material stuff, because they are materialistic and they, they want money out of this and all of that. No? But they don't talk about the people who, who collaborate with the government because the government give them housing and cars. Right. And you know, so I wanted to talk about all of this. And um, and I, it's interesting because I, in a way, I have not exhausted visual arts, but for, in a way, I almost feel that I have a right to a little, a, a wall, 
with visual arts, even performance, not only because the audience is more is reduced, but because it almost feels that we live in a moment where we need narratives, not only gestures, not only images, but narrative, because it almost feels that the battle we're living right now in society is how we rewrite narratives, many of them, you know, not only one, but many. And it seems that many governments are afraid of that. And, and the reaction is to create the one single narrative for everybody, you know? And, and I feel that theater has given me, and I, by the way, I didn't like theater when I was younger because the theater I knew was a very traditional theater, super traditional people screaming, uh, at two meters from me, and I was like, "What is this?" <laughs> but uh, I have rediscovered theater, and I feel it has is a very, very good tool for, you know, for experiencing through the skin of another person. No, and I think now this idea of creating narrative and recuperating history. I also feel that, you know, in general, history is super important at this time because we. We keep doing the same and the same and the same and the same, no? And uh, and and theater is giving me that at the moment, no? Like this this possibility of of saying something that is not related to you, but you can relate to it. And you know, I don't know. It's maybe simplistic what I'm saying for no, no, theater no. people, but not but it's uh, but it's uh, I'm very very happy, no, with this. Uh, I did my first experience. By chance, uh, I was invited to the Boca Biennale in Portugal by John Romao, and uh, it was a very smart uh, proposition for the Biennale. It was he was inviting artists from one genre to do for the first time something in another genre. Mm -hmm. So it was quite exciting, and I decided to do Endgame from Beckett, mm -hmm. which I wanted to do since '98 when I read it for the first time. I got really passionate about it. And I read it more than 10 times in a row. It's quite a thing, okay? I, I was super excited. I could see many things while reading it. And then finally I did it. And I really discover again, you know, the power of, you know, the power of people who want to go there and they're willing to go to many, many experiences. And, and also the power, as I said before, of history, the fact that you're working with the text that already exists and people already, you don't have to teach them. They already have a knowledge of the text somehow, or the history or the narrative of it, about it. And then you add something. I really, I really enjoy it very much, you know? I really mm -hmm. enjoy it uh, in a way. And also having people for an hour, hour and a half, completely attentive is a privilege that we don't have in visual arts because when you do performance, People are passing by, if it's an opening, forget it. Nobody's listening, people are just like talking to each other. And um, so it's a very uh, disruptive uh, spectatorship, no? Mm -hmm. But in theater, the idea that people are willing, you know, to, to go through something is, is quite fascinating for me. And, and for me, uh, I, I've been working a lot with the, with the audience, you know, and I always say that in my work, I taught the audience to become a citizen, an active citizen through a series of exercises. Mm -hmm. I think we, we, we lost uh, Tanya for a moment. Of of audience material. No, sorry, I'm here. Yeah. I'm sorry. The audience is my material. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of my other materials, like history, like narrative. And I really can work with them through one hour, because what happened with performance, I always say, that's why I do short-term and long-term works. I do short-term because in the short-term, you have to shock people. You have to very quickly put them in a mood, in a conversation that might not be finished and might be broken. And you just probably can announce certain details, no? Or, or, or sketch certain things for them to do later. Uh, in the long-term projects, you really work with people. You have um, you have primary audience who are with you, who are part of the work, who work with you through the whole process. And you have this secondary audience that is kind of like the chismosos, all the people who who, who wants to know what's going on um, and come and go. 
But in theater, I really find it's fantastic because it's almost in between. It's almost in between because people who see perform my experience, people who see performance are willing to be shocked, are willing to be surprised, are willing to, to be shaken. And, but I don't know how much in depth you can go with their will to, to be with you, really, you know, to be through the process. And in theater, people want the process. They are waiting for a change. You know, they're waiting for, uh, this is what I have experienced. They're waiting for, uh, go through something because at the end there is something else, you know, they're going to learn or so. And I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm fascinated at the moment by that. Uh, because it's a, it's a nice uh, time mm -hmm. to, yeah. Why Brecht? Why, 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 what's fascinating? Yeah, well, um, it's, in, I, it's very interesting. In Cuba, we, we know many, for example, we, I didn't uh, learn about Beckett in Cuba. I learned about Brecht, about, you know, all Stanislavski, like all this, you know, tradition. Uh, Paulo Freire, for example, I learned later in the United States, ironically, but it was my fault because here they have done quite a bit of Paulo Freire, not too much because they don't like this kind of experiments where people have free ending of anything, but they had some conferences and they have shown some of that. But I, I almost feel that right now we are living also a crisis of the left. And I'm very interested in, uh, in going through um, issues that have defined our ideology, our way of thinking, no? And Breck have nailed some of those. He <laughs> have nailed some of those human conflicts and human, um, for example, when you say, uh, no, I, you know, I didn't do it, and you know you did it, or you say, no, I regret what I say, I, you know, are you doing this because you want to write your work? Like, are you negating yourself, not being a hero, because you want to write all your knowledge and be a hero in a different way? Are you doing it because you are afraid? Are you doing it because, like, how far will you go for your, for your beliefs? And I had personally that situation where I had to decide at the interrogation and, I, and when I was in prison, if I want to say, no, I don't believe this and I regret what I've done, or I will say, no, I will go to the last you know, consequences. So I think this is also very pertinent for today mm -hmm. because in the United States, um, in the United States and Europe and Cuba, and there is a moment now where we need to be willing to have the answer to that question. We need to have the answer to the question, are you willing to go all the way and risk everything for what you think is important, for what you think is just, for what you think is ethical, for what you think is truth, or are you going to keep saying, I don't know, it's too much trouble, or you know, I want, you know, so to making, you know, so I think this is for me a very interesting, very, very interesting uh, issue to bring today to think, you know, to think about that. And there is one phrase that is my favorite of the whole book where um, um, he, he, he say, well, I, I did it, because, uh, Galileo says, I did it because I was afraid of pain. And then immediately they are serving him his meal, you know, like the chicken, whatever. And that's, that's quite intense, you know. I also heard, I didn't see it, but I also heard growing up that there was a time where in Cuba they put this display. And when the guy who was a very famous uh, experimental actor that we had here, when he was doing that scene, he always cried. Because in Cuba, that has been always a dilemma. In order to eat, in order to survive, you have to shut up or you have to go against what you really believe or what is really important for you. 
So I think now this is not only a conundrum that we have in Cuba, it's not only a challenge that we have here, but it's a challenge we have in the whole world. You know, when you see somebody that is deporting a person that flee from their house because they were, uh, I don't know, gangs or, or they were threatened by, you know, the drug dealers or whatever, or because the system didn't work because all the wealth is going to other countries and, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to turn again the face and keep walking or, or the time has arrived for you to say, hey, wait a minute, why are you doing that in quest? You know, so I think this is, we have been in a way get used to a happy, a fake happy and a fake easy life. And this is now maybe something that we have to confront, you know. Is easiness more important than justice? Is, hap is your own happiness more important than a general happiness? And maybe it's smaller for you, but it's shared by more people. So I think these are the things that Brecht really addresses in a very beautiful way because the human condition is always there. You know, like it's always about this moment of humanity where all these ideological big subjects become a very singular experience, you know, that you can identify with, you know. I don't know if that answered the question. No, no, it's a, it's yeah. a, a very, very yeah. profound and yeah. significant. But of course, I'm a visual artist, so mm -hmm. I'm taking a lot of licenses for this yeah. adaptation, but uh, yeah. And becoming, and it's a translation. It's not really an adaptation, it's a translation. Because mm -hmm. what I'm trying is to translate uh, all of this knowledge that I have encountered in this text into something that is more contemporary or that is maybe touching us today in a, in a more immediate way, you know? Because sometimes these texts uh, are beautiful, amazing, but sometimes people think, oh, that was then when the Nazis, that mm -hmm. one then when the Russians or the Soviets. No, no, it's still happening. So it is, uh, that's why I say it's a kind of a translation, no? Uh, yeah. So you are writing a text now? No, 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 I am very scared of writing. I respect so much writers, but uh, I am writing the scenes and the situations. Yeah, it is conceived I think it's theater. I, I still say mm -hmm. it's theater, but I conceive it as a situation, no? Like something people are going to experience. Uh, yes, yeah, just a little moment of uh, connection. At the moment, sorry. Probably not yeah. the internet here. Uh, so yeah. probably it has to change when it travels because um, I will have to find an event or a dilemma that is specific to the place in which the play is happening. Mm -hmm. In order for people to be, to feel more connected and to, you know, and to feel it's happening to them and it's important to them, you know? Mm. Because uh, it's, uh, that's another thing that we do very much with art. We, we very, very commonly, we decide that the work is great, the knowledge is great, but it's, it was then and there, not for us. You know? So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's one of the challenge uh, also that I think we are on to now, which is how can we make people care for those you know, ideas and yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is what I'm doing at the moment. So uh, let's, since we are a bit of a theater audience, so you, it, will it be inside the theater or, um, because we are looking for forms. It is, how, uh, so, uh, yeah, what, what, it what, is. How, how do you react? Because you are now thinking about it in that time of confinement and your political yeah, complication. Yeah. How, yeah. how are you approaching it? And it's important for us in the theater world who are a bit, perhaps, as you say, stuck and uh, some things don't work. So what, what are you going to do? Uh, specifically in these two pieces, the first piece is going to be in a lecture, uh, the Mother Courage uh, citation, let's say, or interpretation or readingness is going to be in uh, the mode of a conference performance, conference mm -hmm. performance, and it's going to be through Zoom, uh, hopefully with people looking at it. 
Um, the second one is going to be live because it's next year. By then, hopefully, everybody. The the the, the, uh, the, uh, the Galileo the Vienna Festival, the Vienna Theater mm -hmm. Festival. Um, but is it going to be outside? Is it going to be? It's going to be the container. Is space. it going to be in this? It's going to be in a contained space, but not a theater. That's what I can tell you. Like uh -huh. we have a space that is was used for something else before, and we're going to re. Uh, very minimal because I don't want to spend a lot of money in like redecorating anything, but actually working with the history of the place, which is very common, of course, in theater. Um, and um, and it's going to be an experience people are going to have together mm -hmm. in this place. So, yeah. I cannot tell you more. No, before. no, no. That's fine. Um, just, just so. To and know. I have to say, just mm -hmm. to say, because the first time I talk about theater in, a, like, in these kind of lectures, no, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for the people who have uh, given me the chance, you know, mm -hmm. to explore uh, this medium, uh, John Romao, um, uh, um, Christophe um you know uh, marie like all these people from all this festival christophe is from the the vienna festival and he was before at kunst art festival and uh yeah and all these people uh, desde lola arias of course who invited me and uh, milo rao who also invited me the other day to talk so i want to thank all these people who are giving me the opportunity to I don't know. Yeah, no, they are fantastic. I put myself artists. where I don't yeah. belong, but at least. To, you know, no, you really do. Um, to, I mean, Milo Rao. Say hi yeah. and, uh, and uh, at least have a conversation that it has been so far very, 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 uh, very rich for me, no? Because, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Milo Rao and Bo Slola are on the yeah. Siegel talk, and uh, yeah. we heard from them. Um, and I think we, we, we need to have a dialogue. So it's, it's quite uh, stunning to hear that you say a theater is becoming of an interest. Your performances, we often were censored or you gave this one minute of talk. Everybody mm -hmm. could say what they want and you got into trouble. I remember uh, Claire Bishop, the great Claire Bishop once gave a talk and she showed the performance in Cuba that was censored. And you said, yeah. everybody should come and see the show that's not happening. And, exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, um, and uh, uh, what you did, you're eating think, mud, you know, you're eating yeah. earth and salt, all that. So now you say, perhaps that's a bit limited. We had Peter Schumann from the Bread and Puppet Theater. I don't know if you know about them. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of who course. said, I, I was with Merce Cunningham. Personal. Yeah, he said, we were with Merce Cunningham and John Cage. I was in the studios. I was a dancer. But I felt it was a bit, what you said, a bit limited. He said, I wanted to go on the street. So he went to the Lower East Side. He said, we also performed in Spanish. We had translated Puerto Rican mothers ask us to do a play yeah. about their sons. So um, maybe that is also a moment, you know, where we really have to reconsider. So it's significant what you say, because you represent the very best of contemporary art, visual art. So um, that's quite a- No, but, but I agree with you. I think there are two different conversations. One is about the medium, and of course, performance for me is like doing a poem. It's like doing a poem. It's short, it's impactful, impregnates in people certain verses you never forget, you know. It's... But theater, even if it's super experimental, like Tim Eschel and like all these people, like Milo or Laura, Lola, all these people doing amazing experimental work, still the the precondition of the audience is what makes a difference for me because they're willing to do so Sometimes performance, even if you know you're going to see a performance, your expectations are very clear, you know? It's mm -hmm. like a little bomb that explodes and then you experience this uh, wave of uh, shakiness mm -hmm. and then you go, no? Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the thing, but the other thing Yes, just a short moment. It's what you say. If I, sorry, like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we have to redefine. No, this is the internet. Don't worry, I'm, I'm still here. You have to redefine who we have to redefine who our audience is. What is the language that that audience speaks? What are the language you want to speak with them? Because there is at the beginning of the revolution, there was this quite interesting uh, discussion about. Does art has to go 
lower itself to the people or do people have to come up to art? This was, this was a, a very, very specific um, a statement that was for a decade being discussed. And out of that, many amazing work came. For example, the work of Ramiro Guerra, who is a choreographer, who actually brought all the Afro-Cuban uh, tradition, religion, and so on to contemporary and classical ballet. You know, and yes, people wanted to go because they want to know about their venerated saints from Africa in this, but the language, it was a super sophisticated language of dance and ballet. So, so it's interesting how to see, I, I do think the world is now ready for having this discussion about what language are we using? There are many examples, it's not the first time this is going to be discussed, but bread and puppet theater, of course, fantastic example. But also, sometimes when there is this thing about, oh, we want to talk for a broader audience, for people who are not initiated into the art, have no knowledge, have no training, etc. Many times there are, uh, I don't want to say mistake, but let's say missteps, because either you simplify your message because you want it to be uh, understand and so then it goes to this kind of generate um, generic art no the, what do you say in art they say oh this doesn't talk it's so generic what are they doing no or you go into this situation where you are pretending to talk the language of quote to quote the people the streets uh, certain classes certain groups certain communities but really you're doing this as almost a zoo for people who don't belong to this, you know, almost as an ethnographic experience for people who, who are not part of this. So I think there is this tension that, of course, will probably never be solved completely, but it is interesting to now think about that. The internet is being used so much right now. So many people, I don't do many because here is super expensive, the internet, so I do very little Zooms, but so many people are doing Zooms from eight in the morning to eight at night that it has created almost a culture, a culture of how can you participate without being physical? I wonder how we can use this for art, but also how can we, how can we, um, how can we understand and create a situation where we think about attention span? Because it's very hard. Now you and me are here, but if we had 20 people in this, uh, you know, frame, it's going to be easy for me to just, you know, relax and or do something else or take coffee or whatever. No. So how can we work in 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 um, in formats that don't um, force the people or don't demand from the people the full attention? No, like this. Or, and at the same time, I think now people are very tired of Zoom and I heard people are like overwork, etc. But I think it's like when the computer laptop first started a personal computer, like people got tired very quickly as well because it's a new way of doing stuff, no? But I have a lot of hope in this kind of, uh, I don't know, non, not touchable experience, but yeah. I don't know, I, I wonder if, I don't know, I think we do need to, to think about this. It's a very, very unique opportunity, very unique opportunity. And it's not only, uh, let's say, um, that doesn't mean that experiences like, like for example, sometimes theaters or, or, or festivals, music festivals, I remember in Austria as well, once I went to this festival in Salzburg that was so open and everybody was there. And, but at the same time, yeah, it's open, but open to whom? No? And, and yeah, I don't know. But I, I don't know, this is what I'm thinking. And, and also how can we make sure that people understand that art is a tool for the life. It's not only entertainment, you know, it's not only what you do when you have a spare time, but art has a knowledge in it that could help you to live better to could help you. That's why I do art because I need myself to, 
to solve certain things. And uh, I do tell us why you, why you do art. That is important. Tell us. Because of that. First, because uh, I, do, I do art because there are many things that I don't understand. And I have used all my life art as the resource to understand what happens out there. Um, not only, it's, it's, less, it's less a communication tool for me, although I'm very communicative in my work, you know, and I, I'm interested for people to understand, etc. But for me personally, it's less a communicative tool than it is an analytical tool and a, and a resource to understand things. A, a, a way for me to divide the reality into different chaotic moments or systems um, and to break the fake um, rigidity of uh, life, you know, that this is this, this is this, this is this, because it was said one day, you know, and to understand how certain current goes from one place to another, even when they are invisible. No, and art helped me all this year to see that and to understand. And the second, that's how I use art. The why I use art and when I use do art is when I see injustice. It has been the only tool I have. I mean, I'm an activist. I, I have other resources as an activist. But the only way I have been able to express my anger, my fear, my stubbornness, my confidence, my desires, my, my hope is when I see injustice happening, that then art for me is always the answer. It's, it has been the way in which I put all of this, where I put all of this. And it's inter interesting because so many times when injustice is made, the people who are executing the injustice knows they are doing something unfair and bad and wrong and unjust. And this fascinates me, why the person knows this. I mean, not everybody, but many people do. And they are in certain place on the brain, there is some little light that say, this is not right, you know? And why you keep doing it, you know? So I think when, I'm, when I see something like that, and, and many times this, there are many problems in the world who are of course very complex, hard, you know, but, at the same time, some of them are very easy to solve. Not easy in the, in the pedestrian way of using the word, you know, like, oh, it's easy. No, 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 easy in the sense like there are solutions already out there that people know that if they do them, they will not benefit. So that's what makes me really angry. <laughs> You know, you say, why, this, why, you don't, why don't you legalize all the immigrants in the United States? This is not going to be a problem from the country. There is, uh, you know, all this narrative completely fake, you know, like it's going to be good. This is, you know, and yeah, I mean, this is to put one example, no? And it's, it's interesting because for example, I'm a woman, I'm a feminist. I've been fighting for the rights of women in this country, in Cuba also, and, and so on. But my work, the other day I had an interview, a written interview and they say, why don't you work about this subject? And I say, because I have this problem solved. That I solved my position about being a woman and an artist and an activist in this place has been, I, I solved it through my work a while ago. And now I don't need to do art about this anymore because I, I solved it for myself, mm -hmm. you know? I, it's a little selfish, but that's, you know, I do art for me. And then in the process, other people are invited and some people feel related, some feel not related, some people feel pushed, some people feel, you know, but I think art should be done for you. And that's not, let me explain this. I'm not saying this as an egoistic, uh, egotistical statement. I say that because you have to search inside you what really makes you uneasy with the world. And this is what gives you the force to do work that other people can relate to because they also feel in this, you know? And also you do, you do it for you because I feel that, again, my work is super social, is I'm very interested in everybody understanding what I'm saying, feeling it, etc. But if, um, if you do work 
about um, something that really troubles you, you know, socially, etc. You're going to touch or you're going to search a, a, the way in which not this problem materialized in the world, but the way in which it is generated. No, and this for me is very important for doing art. I'm not interested in showing what already is there that you can see in CNN, you know. I'm interested in trying to see, and that's what I think art does, trying to go to the essence of what was the moment of conception or, or, or birth of this trouble, you know, that this situation that is not being resolved. Uh, I don't know. It's a little abstract, but this is no, 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 uh, not at all. What I what I mean, no, and uh, yeah, and of course I think uh, of the people, and many many times I changed some decisions in the form of the work because I know that I have to change the channel of communication. Uh, but already that work of searching why this is happening and so on uh, has happened, um, and many times I don't resolve the project which I love. And people are saying, oh, you're doing social experiments. Eh, okay, what is the problem? Governments do social experiments. Why can artists don't do it? And also people who all enter art centers and enter a theater, they already know they're going to have an experiment, whatever it is. Uh, but it is true that we still have, and, and that therefore sometimes I don't finish the work. I just present a dilemma and it is, unfolding and, and resolved by the audience itself. No? Um, but also we have this problem in the arts lately because this extra super institutional, institutionalization of the arts where the audience has become a no zone zone. You know, like you don't go there, you don't offend them, you don't, you don't touch uh, subjects that are sensitive, you don't, you protect them so much that art has become an extremely safe place. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine a piece like Please Love Austria for, from uh, Christoph Slinginschef. I don't know how to pronounce perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, Slinginschef. You, I, I hardly imagine that piece being done today. Mm -hmm. Very hard because institutions will not allow it because you have to respect this, you have to respect that, you have, and it is not about offending people. I don't like art that is for sake of a scandal or shock. I don't, this is boring. But in order to go deep into the human soul, you have to touch things that are harsh, that are difficult, that maybe are not resolved, not even for you as an artist. So, so then go to this kind of uh, everybody's happy. It's, not happy, but you know what I mean, like uh, mm -hmm. this kind of overprotection of audiences. And uh, for example, in museums, it happens a lot. Like people, like uh, sometimes you're going to do an installation in a museum and you spend more time talking to the technical staff that work in security than to the curators. Mm -hmm. Because you have to make sure that there are two exits, you have to make sure people don't trip, you have to make sure. For example, when I did the piece at MoMA, uh, in 2007, 18, I think, um, they, they bought one of my projects uh, I did in Cuba in the year 2000, and it's a tunnel. You enter a very long, a 50 meter, uh, 50 meters, uh, I think it's 150 feet, I think. Very, very, very long, very, very long tunnel that smell of something, you don't know what it is unless you're from the Caribbean or a sugar island. Uh, because it's rotten sugar cane, and there is no light at all. the The floor is completely uneven, so people who walk they have no stable anything. It's quite scary. It's dark. You don't see anything. The smell like it's super sensorial. And then you walk, you see a little light, and you say, "Okay, let me go to the light." And then you see um, the image of Fidel Castro and this kind of news and so on. And when you turn because the light that comes um, from the entrance and because your eyes get used to darkness, then you realize that you have been next to four naked men who have been, uh, let's say, uh, first, in the first moment, you will think, oh, they're guarding this video, you know, this TV. Then later you say, well, they look like a broken 
mechanism because they're doing the same gesture over and over. Each of them is different gesture. And at the end you realize they're slaves, you know, and that you are in the midst of this. And, and this was amazing. I was amazed. The creator it was um, Stuart Comer. I was amazed that they allow to do yeah. certain things that in museums in the US and in Europe, you cannot do like darkness uh, or even. I was amazed. I mean, we had to put uh, train everybody as a firefighter and it was quite interesting. That's another anecdote, but but I was amazed, but it was, it took a long time. And we talk more with these people, I say, than with the, you know, I mean, the creator was all the way because he's amazing, but, but we, and, and this is happening not only in, in visual arts, it's happening also in theater. Take, wash out, don't, don't touch this uh, subject, uh, don't touch that other subject, uh, people are sensitive and, and you know, and, and this, I'm very sad for this, no? I, I don't like uh, a scandal for the sake of it, as I said before, but you know, I, I wonder, if we should be back in 1917, 1910, 1920s, where people were, you know, throwing tomatoes at the people, in, you know, why not? Why not having a different channel of communication with mm -hmm. people, no? Why we have to please the audience? Why artists had, have to become slaves of audiences and a slave of, the social moment they have lived in. And that's something I wonder. <laughs> I mean, this is the thing I'm thinking. You say, what are you thinking? This is the thing I'm thinking these days, no? Um, yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> no, these are, these are um, such serious yeah. and important questions. It's to be slave of the moment, the slave of the audience. That's um, what happened when you are alone in your house for three months. Yeah. You start thinking about stuff all the time. Yeah. yeah. No, and I, I haven't also, found the solution yet, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Your point to say that the institution itself also represents the society. So let's say you're a theater maker, you're a radical, but you do whatever the theater directors of that theater tell you, you follow the rules, the union, the, you don't go out. You, yeah. So how can that be? How can that be that? Uh, yeah, it's like the main actor gets paid more and uh, has more lines. It's not democratically, yeah. text is not distributed, but René Polish does it, the mm -hmm. folks, but he says, we talk about this, the way we produce has to be different. Yeah, I if agree. We write, I mean, if we write a play about this, but we do the different. Thomas Osterender from Berlin Festspiele said, you know, we do a, something, an exhibition about climate change, but we have the air conditioning running. We, exactly. With Latour, we say, we don't want to do it. Let's see, can we do that? But it's insane. But it could be done, but it's insane to use natural light. Yeah. You know? No, and this is a good point. I mean, I'm not an expert in theater as mm -hmm. an institution because I'm very recently experimenting there and being invited. I'm a guest. I'm not an mm -hmm. expert or anything. But, uh, but in general, our institutions, is, it, the thing is like it has become, I think after Twitter, especially after the, the culture of Twitter, it has become so easy to announce what you believe, but not to do it. Because you almost feel that saying it have substitute the hard work to, to do it. Yeah. You no, know? because it, it's enough. You put, uh, right. I believe in the, everybody's equal. Fantastic, this person is awesome. Yeah, but what have you done? Mm. You know, like, so it's not activism. That, yeah, this is not changing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's, 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 uh, it's another way of faking it. I'm not saying it's fake, just for the haters <laughs> in, the, in the internet. I'm not saying it's fake. I'm saying it's another way of faking it because only you can demonstrate what you think by your action. I, this is my belief, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you have to explain it, say it, etc. But I think these that start happening to people have been incorporate institu institutions where they just say, oh, we are against uh, racism. But that's not enough, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the other day there was uh, somebody circulating this 
this question about, yeah, yeah, they want so much to be against racism, why they don't retire these very, very old uh, curators in certain institutions who are white, and they have been there for 40 years or 50 years, and uh, maybe it's time to put a new person as a black, for example, African-American. So I think these are interesting, this is why I think now, again, I don't think it's going to happen, but I, I am enjoying the fact that we are living a social uh, turbulence, you know, in which this thing that supposed to never happen, that were only aspiration and utopia and very ridiculized by people, this is just utopia. Now, actually, we are in a moment that is so, has been uh, shaken so much that we can actually go into these cracks and maybe do something, no? Uh, but for example, this is why I like so much uh, when I work with Tate Modern in London, because when we proposed this change of the name of the building, first of all, it was going to be only for one year because they do this commission every year, so they change artists, and they actually left it permanently, which says really? a lot, mm -hmm. says a lot about the institution. I'm very proud of them. I mean, of course, that institution have problem, but I'm very, very proud yeah. of them, and also we were able to put Natalie Bell, that's the name of the person, um, as part of the advisory council. Really? So we were able to put someone from the neighborhood into the um, advisory council, council where she has a different perspective of other people who are saying what the exhibition should be done next year or in five years, what the community needs. So I think that I was very proud of Tate because they they walk the walk, they say, no? They they not only enunciate a principle, an ethical principle, but they enacted it. And I think that's what is lacking in a lot of institutions. You know, a lot of institutions. It's always hard, it's always a sacrifice to um, to put into action your beliefs. It's always a sacrifice. But why, for example, a big museum don't say, okay, the director say, okay, my pay is a million dollars a year. I'll take half of that. And with that money, I pay, I don't know, three months of the staff or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So why people are not willing? I don't know. But I, I think we are in a good moment if we can take advantage of it. Unfortunately, yeah, I'm not so sure, but yeah, hopefully. Well, I see all the protests in the U.S. I think that's already something. No? What do you think about the protests in the U.S.? No, I think people are fed up. I mean, especially uh, I, I, the first time I cried in my life, like a, like a teenager again, was the day of the election of Trump. I know now it's more popular to say this, but that day I was in a train going to, to a residency I was in. And I cry like somebody who have lost the protection shield because I'm from Cuba, I fight here, but I always know that when I go there, I can, uh, to the US, I, I have friends, I have spaces where I can have protection, I can say what I want, you know, and, and I can rest and not the uh, vacation, but rest in the sense of intellectually can, you know, nourish myself with all the knowledge of all the people in the world who have done stuff. And for me, this has been a very important learning curve in my life and it's, you know, been almost my second country in a way. But it's more like saving space, you know, my safe space. And that day I cried because I say, I have no place to look like to go to now because this is going to be like authoritarian and it's going to be a dictatorship and it's going to be, you know, I say this that same day because people who have lived under those circumstances, they know. I remember a friend of mine, Cuban, who moved to Venezuela. He was, you know, he was censored here in Cuba in the arts and he decided to go to Venezuela. It's very similar, etc. before Chavez. The day Chavez was uh, elected or put into power, he start preparing his bags to leave. And everybody say, oh, you're crazy, you're exaggerating. I say, no, I already lived this and I know what is coming. 
And, uh, and this is a, an interesting thing. I put on my Facebook back then, this is what is going to happen. He's going to go against the press. He's going to discur uh, this, um, take the, the respect we have for, for, for the law. We are, I, I put like a little like 10 points or something because I know that was the answer of everybody who was American at this, at this was, this is not Cuba, or this is not a dictatorship. We have everything already in place, so this doesn't happen. Uh, we have institution, and my answer is like, we also had institutions in Cuba. Some institutions had 100 years old, and they were dismantled. So institutions only work as long as they do their duty. If you have somebody in the institution that is willing to change what they think, what they think is right for what is good for them, that's the beginning of the dismembering of institutions. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, you haven't got that far, but you're getting pretty close. And <laughs> and uh, thank God, uh, he, the Trump is uh, has a very very bad aesthetical aesthetic taste. Because if he had a good aesthetic taste, you will be in bigger trouble. But he's so not aesthetic. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's easier to reject him. But uh, I think it's very important that people say it's enough. You know, like I don't, I don't. I'm a, I'm, I'm a peaceful person. I'm a pacifist. I don't agree with with. Uh, I know it's a resource, but I don't agree or profess violence of any kind. But I think it's enough. Like, how many people have to die already? You know, like how many? And and also, yeah. I I the way I see it from here, which is quite different because I'm I cannot follow the day to day. I only have pieces and bits of what is happening. The most highlights um, is that people are are asking for structural changes. They're not asking for a singular justice for a singular person. They're asking for a structural change already. And I understand the anger, believe me. Like, I wish more people protest about other things as well. <laughs> like, uh, they're giving an example, but I wish there were more people protesting about other things. But it's impressive that the transversality of this, uh, at least what I see on the news, no? On the, some uh, New York Times and stuff. It's amazing the transversality of, of the protest. It's, it's quite impressive. I don't know what do you, you are there. Have you seen, what do you think about them? Um, I do think you are right. I do think um, it is a moment, um, if there ever was one, um, of kind of a perfect storm, the COVID crisis, uh, 40 yeah. million people unemployed, a disastrous healthcare system that's failed Exactly. One percent perhaps might have immunity to have a herd immunity is seventy percent. If the vaccine doesn't come fast, that American as yeah. Hannah Arendt, who you created this, that uh, yeah. great institute, she said, you know, it's yeah. a chimera, it's a fata morgana, and she actually did say it started to default yeah. the American dream in the invasion of the Ping Bay in Cuba. She said this was the beginning, the end, and she at the time put that up and said it's yeah. going to lead to an authoritarian one, and we have to fight for freedoms. But um, right now, um, yeah. um, because it really now no people say we, we could die, you know, as you said, that that's Galileo yeah. moment. What do I do? Yeah. Do I stick to the truth? And what people say about science or are, are you willing to die for your belief? And are you able to have the awe and wonder of the world? You know, can you do both and um, in art? And, um, and, uh, and I think, yeah, it is, it is a moment. And the question is, how will we what will we do with the knowledge we have and um, right. and where, 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 where will it lead? So- um, right. And I think, I think people are very knowledgeable right now and they understand that every disaster we had in the world, the only profit has gone to the 1% basically, who mm -hmm. buys more, who like basically, <clears throat> it's interesting, of course, it was an accident, whatever. I don't know. I don't want to debate the origins. I don't know. There's many theories. But um, whatever it was, we are living in the Third World War. Mm -hmm. The Third World War is not 
people with guns? Is people with resources? Is understanding these people are going to be eliminated? You know, like, and and mm -hmm. why? Because all the war, war the world wars have been a redistribution of wealth, all of them. And this is again another massive redistribution of wealth. That's why I, I think it's a world war, the third one. People are dying, but the same way in the war, but it's not with guns. This time is is yeah, it's a redistribution of wealth. That's what we're living. And that's and maybe why I'm speculating, maybe why people are even more fed up. Because yeah. they know that all this life has been spared for some I mean, how many yachts do you need to be happy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how many, how many generations you need to provide for in order to be happy enough? You know, like it's like I don't know. I, I have uh, I mean I have nothing against people you know, developing economically satisfied, but there is a moment where it's too much. Like it, it is disgustingly too much. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and this is this is I think also what we're looking at. You know, people saying how many lives we need to give for you know, I don't know. Mm. At least here in Cuba has been also um, a waking up of the activism because for the everybody sit at home uh, well let me say not everybody is at home there has been for the first time very clear people who are at home and people who are outside so there is a different of class people who are at home are people who are have more resources and they can have i mean i don't have it but i know a lot of people have this kind of app where you can buy food from an app and they bring it to your house, but it's in dollars. Mm -hmm. So not everybody has 10 or 20 or $45 to have uh, some vegetables coming to your house. Uh, so it is very clear a partition of class. People who have not that much money, they have to do eight to 14 hours of a line mm -hmm. waiting to see if they get a little piece of chicken incredible you know so this is extremely intense right now there is no food no there is no egg there is no rice there is no milk uh i don't also cafe coffee is i don't see it anywhere so basically the government and this is an interesting situation that now people have internet yeah you can have trouble it's very expensive you know uh, one gigabyte is ten dollars, wow. and we are having no, no. But we are having ten euros because the cook is equivalent to euro, not to dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and we are having this big campaign against the monopoly because it's funny. Cuba is a socialist country, but all of the things are monopolies. Monopolies. How you say monopoly? monopoly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but all of them. The the. Um, an empresa no? the, of uh, the telephone company is private monopoly of the government. And there is no competition, nothing. So they put the price whatever they want, you know, so we cannot protest. I mean, we are protesting, but they, they don't care. Um, so basically it's super expensive. And for example, we have detected many people, not only the activists, normal people who are in the street, uh, who don't want to be political, have protests because the one gigabyte go faster than it should be. So you lose a gigabyte on, for example, I don't know, a few hours. Even if you don't see videos, you don't see Netflix, you don't see nothing. You know, you just maybe on Facebook sending some things on WhatsApp and so on. So basically, um, this is one interesting moment where people who never wanted to be political because they have been miseducated into the government decide for you what is or what is not political and what is what you should care or not about, now are changing that, are rebelling and I, are putting stuff on Facebook has become the public square. It's impressive, you know? People are putting videos, are putting... Uh, the, uh, denouncing stuff and so on. 
What is the reaction of the government? They enact a law they did in 2018 when they were worried about internet and the people, which is the decree 370, 370, where the government put a fine of 3,000 uh, pesos, which is outrageous amount of money for people here. Um, if you put something on Facebook, they don't like, the government doesn't like. And if it's something that they find offensive, whatever, they put you in prison for a post on Facebook. This is insane. So uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, groups of activists have come together to fight against this. We have done many, many actions already. And the government now is kind of in the corner and trying to justify, no, we don't mean this, but yeah, you, we have all the photos of all the people and, and the reason, and now, Something that is interesting is that for the first time in a long time, okay, okay, the police and the security of the state has been extremely violent with activists. This is separate. But now the government has made the people the enemy, which is quite bizarre, quite bizarre. Bizarre. The reason why there is nothing in the store is because there are three or two people who bought everything and they have it in their house. Come on. Like how? Really? Really? The whole country has no food because there are four people who bought uh, 60 uh, things of rice. I mean, come on. Yeah. So it is kind of interesting that the mentality that they are creating is not anymore the external enemy, although still, and Trump is not helping because he's doing all this stuff that helping, him, yeah. gave him the ammunition, no, and so on. But but now we have an internal enemy that is ourselves, all of us. Yeah. We are all but, enemies. You know? Yeah, <laughs> as Brecht said, yeah. As Brecht once <laughs> said, uh, the government uh, will dissolve the people and and uh, elect new people, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. yeah. If they're so unhappy with them. And, uh, no, no, it's that really is, insane. That is and for the first time, they're starting to be a little violent. And I'm very worried about that mm. because they start, uh, why? Because people, for example, before they were taking somebody, say, oh, he's a dissident, he's against the government. Like, it's not my problem, right? But mm. now it's for anything because you don't have the mask. And I agree mm. with the law that you should have the mask. Okay, fine, it's for your protection. But you don't need to. To beat somebody because it doesn't have the mask or bring him mm -hmm. to the to the station mm -hmm. to to sleep one night there because I mean, and now they are there is a this a, a dissident but uh, that uh, the police uh, hit him so bad that he lost an eye. This is new in Cuba. This is we never heard of this craziness, and I'm worried about that. To be honest, I'm very worried about that mm -hmm. because that shows that uh, that shows that. They're losing power and they don't understand how to move to a new yeah. political yeah. situation, you know, or, or proposal. Yeah. And the I'm big, very nervous about that. Yeah, it's the big question also here for the US. Will that be a somehow violent, a violent protests, uh, uprisings, killings on both sides? And uh, what will happen? Can it be controlled? And how much, even if it's over corona, what will the post-stress syndrome be? What will how will people yeah, react? people are always crazy. Remember, people always look yeah, at people yeah are crazy. even now. But what will happen yeah. afterwards? So we we don't know, and we need you know solutions. And I think, as you said, art can make can make a contribution. We are coming closer to to the end, and really, uh, what you said is so profound, so significant. Thank you. Um, uh, to say, yeah, to think about this because my internet is over. So. No, it's fantastic. No, no, no. That the institution. I think yeah. Heiner Müller said about theater. The theater is the state. We have to fight against the theater if you want to make real theater. You he said if you want to uh, use Brecht, you don't uh, criticize him. That's treason. That's what Brecht <laughs> wanted. You know, we you had Jean Luc. Him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Jean Luc Nancy, also the philosopher, he was on our program. He said, "What is the value?" of the value of life right now, of the oh, old person okay. or the other. So yeah, we have values, but how much is it worth to a society and who decides yeah, yeah. what's the value of the value? And literally, I think one of the biggest dilemma we have today is the mm -hmm. one in Galileo, in, in yeah. uh, Bre yeah. brought in Galileo. It's like, are you willing to defend an idea mm -hmm. or your idea of truth? Mm -hmm. Or are you willing to live 
and think of yourself and survive and live better with yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And you know, and this is something yeah. that I that we can see as a personal decision, but this goes into institution and this goes into society, and this mm -hmm. this is not just somebody to say I'm going to look and eat my chicken. No. Yeah. That's true. And this also is a, is a conduct, a behavior that people have in institutions. Yeah. yeah. And I remember that one scene, I think, in Galileo when he is in the palace and he's about to have to make up his mind, be arrested or not, and he sees the chandelier moving. It's a pendulum, you know? So the rotation of the earth. So he's right. He yeah. knows. He sees it. And that what, yeah. what Brecht said, oh, my, uh, my children of the technological age, that view of Galileo to see something a bigger law a structure and to commit to it to do better that is what it is and now we have as we always say here the children of the digital age as you said it's a yeah. big chance even grandparents who never had a phone who never knew what a video is or how to download or watch something on vimeo they do and something is um, is changing so as a closing oh, question thing, yeah mm -hmm. and the other thing there is a history of activism now that is quite clear it's, it's not so old, but it's mm -hmm. old enough that we know that things work. So you tell know? us maybe about, as a final thing, what works, what should artists be doing? What, in, for us in Corona time, what should we be thinking about? I would not dare to tell people what to do. Well, like just say, what do you think? Do. <laughs> no, well, but what do you think? No, what works? I think, I think, what I works? Know. What do you think is meaningful to do right now for in confinement, but also what works in activism? I. I what has worked for me, let's say, yeah. is having this as a time to reevaluate and reassess. It's a forced vacation in a way. Uh, of course, we're still interacting with the world, but it's a forced. Uh, I, 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 okay, one ad advice I see or something I have also taken is not to confuse anxiety. The anxiety of not having a job, of, of not being present, you know, artists think if they disappear for six months, nobody remembers them, you know, like forget anxiety. Don't confuse the anxiety with the mission that you have as an artist, you know, because sometimes we take decisions because we are anxious. We, oh my God, I have to do all of this because if I don't do this now, I, nobody will notice. And don't confuse that with the mission you have as an artist, which is what you should be doing. And I think taking this time uh, forget uh, so many zoom so many calls so many sometimes you need to think within yourself you know some there are times to give and there are times to absorb you know and to please have a balance between those two because it have, has that's why i think i wanted to stop uh, at some point i mean i was forced not to do it but because sometimes you giving 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 and then at some point you don't have anything left to give and you're not giving nothing of value of quality. And the fact, the act of giving is not enough. You have to give something that is useful for others, you know, to make worth it, the giving. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we need to balance, no? And also for some artists, not in the theater, because I don't know this, but in the visual arts, sometimes some artists want to be uh, almost like, the example of capitalism they want to be the artist the one that it, no 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 no. there is space for everybody give space for everybody so you can have a space for yourself you know don't try to accumulate so much attention wealth or possibilities then you don't give to others yeah, yeah. i don't know that's what i've been no thinking. that is a super super important and great yeah. and uh, and you really and thank you for uh, talking no, to us, and, and I hope uh, we didn't offset your balance because now you're also with us, you know. But uh, but thank you. This mm -hmm. is extremely meaningful and important so for much. us to hear, and especially from someone like you, who has taken action, on mm -hmm. who has produced work. It's the so time it, for action. That's it for is sure. some, Yeah, it's something meaningful to hear it from you, and uh, because it's I, not just Twitter. I also I have the project here in Cuba, the Institute of Art and activism, Hannah Arendt, and the motto that um, I have for the project is desire, think, act. We have to have those three. Desire, <laughs> think. Desire, think, act. Act. That because sometimes, uh, thinking of Cuba, sometimes people act without thinking too much because it's this kind of passion of 
Sometimes you just desire and you stay at home and don't do anything. And sometimes you think too much that you don't do anything and forget what you desire, no? Yeah. So yeah, that's been my, uh, my magic triangle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. And I want to read, you know, also what you have, I think on your website, you, you quote Václav Havel, who is a, ah, yes. was a president, but also a playwright from ours. And yes, said, yes. You playwright, if the world is to change for the better, it must be in human consciousness and the very humanness of the modern mankind, you know, so. I agree. No, he was. We a must to change and, and we must uh, do it. So, really, thank you. It's something you do. Yeah, thank you so much. And you much. did. It's inspiring and represented for all of us. And as you say, not everybody has to be able to meet in the Tate or Morgan or whatever. Do it at your yeah. home, your neighborhood, in your family. Exactly. Your exactly. It's the same I contribution. Tell, I always tell my student when I'm teaching performance. I understand that young people want to achieve, you know, a certain status, and of course, there's nothing wrong with that. Etc. But I always tell them, remember that absolutely all the art movement you are studying, and all the artists you have seen as performers, it started by being important to their peers, to their friends, to the neighbors, to their generation, and not to the institution. That's and so this is something that we need to to balance. Yeah, you know? that's good to think about. I never thought about it this way. That is. Yes, I look at this. That's a start. You know. That's a start. You're right. Fantastic. The start well, is listen. always with your friends. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's uh, that's such a great. And sometimes you end up when if you don't pay attention, you know, uh, yeah, with exactly. that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. really, really, thank you. Tomorrow we have a host data from Rwanda. Uh, a country that oh, also to traumatic uh, changes and how what is she doing how is she reacting and then uh saman amini amazing. iranian refugee mm -hmm. who arrived in the netherlands and mm -hmm. create when somehow ended up in acting school and nice. theater work let's see what he has to say again uh, tanya this has uh, been uh, very significant and important to us thank you thank you for sharing for our listeners so to much. take time we went a little bit over time but this wasn't very important uh, uh to listen, and, Tanya, and I want you all to talk. And I have to say that I have a lot of hope with the Cuban activists because in this coronavirus moment, we have been one for the first time ever. We have been working so strong together. So this is good. That is good. Yeah. So thank you so much. And maybe we'll check <laughs> in. You. And really, thank you for making time. Thanks for our audience thank to you. listen. It's also important that Tanya knows people do care what happens in Cuba and about the work and her life's mission and her art that there is a receptive audience, as she said, because we need theater performance, but we also need the audience, and the audience has to follow up what she said, the desire, and then the dream, but to also have an action, and this is ultimately what it is all about. Thank you. Thanks for HowlRound for hosting Thank us, you. Vijay and Thea and Travis, and then, uh, of course, my team, Sun Young. And Thank Andy. you so much. And please do uh, chime in again, and I hope, uh, uh, Tanya, you will um, also uh, be safe. Uh, from Same corona, for you but guys, also, please. you know, in your in your detentions, I know it's dangerous what you do. It's easy for us to talk. It's something very, very different what you do, where things have consequences. So, um, all the best, and uh, and uh, let us know Take what you're doing. Everybody, everybody should check in. It's on Saturday. Uh, Lula Arias's talk with you. It's on Saturday. Saturday, yeah. And how can people get onto it? They go to. Uh, uh, they can go to the website, uh, my I'm documents. My I documents. can send it to my documents. If you put in Google Lola Arias, my documents, and they have Tim Mitchell and, and Tim other Mitchell. artists awesome. there. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. So, okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank and you. thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks.